Patterns of Inheritance, Chapter 11. Sudden Death on the Court. This is about an athlete who just after a game was sitting on the sidelines and all of a sudden uh, died. So after one game, she died while sitting uh, next to the court. This is this was due to Marfan syndrome, which essentially char uh, is characterized by, by having large hands, large feet, being tall, slender, and unfortunately also a risk of sudden death. So some of these traits really made her an excellent volleyball player, but of course the other side of it was a greater risk of sudden death. Died of a ruptured aorta. That is the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart, so it's the biggest artery in, in the body. So if it, if it bursts, it's basically going to be more or less instant death. Died of a ruptured aorta due to a mutation effect, affecting the fibrillin protein. So fibrillin, what it does is it strengthens some tissues, also trapping growth factors which stimulate tissue repair, cell division, uh, which would so it, this would normally prevent excessive cell division. This protein normally traps growth factors and prevents them from stimulating more growth and more cell division. So the mutated version of this gene causes a different protein that is unable to trap these growth factors, which means that people tend to grow taller and have larger hands and larger feet. People with the mutated version of the fibrillin that can't trap the growth factors, so some parts of their bodies grow excessively, including their artery walls. One defective copy is enough to cause Marfan syndrome. Sometimes a genetic disease, you have to have two copies. In this case, you only need one copy to have Marfan syndrome. And remember, you get one copy of every gene from the father and one copy of every gene from the mother. So this, this chapter is more generally about inheritance. And inheritance is the process by which the characteristics of individuals are passed to their offspring. Genes encode these characteristics, and then the alleles are randomly distributed to gametes via meiosis. Here we have a picture of the Baldwin brothers. Notice they are very similar. They share about 50% of their genes, or excuse me, their DNA with each other, their alleles with one another. They Remember, all, all homo sapiens have the same genes, but we have different alleles. Now, brothers are going to have more of the same alleles in common, which is what makes them look more similar to each other. But of course, they have some alleles that are different, which is the reason that they do not look exactly the same. They have different versions of alleles. And that's largely due to metaphase one, where random distribution of homologs on either side of the equator of the cell will determine what chromosome a given gamete will receive. Genes, and also a pair of homologous chromosomes shown right here. So some terms we need to know. A gene, unit of heredity, encodes information to form a particular characteristic or trait. The location of a gene on a chromosome is called its locus, and we usually represent them with uh, colors. And these are much bigger than the actual gene is. So I'm circling one on the left and then one on the right. So those, would, uh, those both represent the same gene and in that case, different alleles, and because it's the same gene, they're at the same locus. Genes for the same characteristic are found at the same loci on both homologous chromosomes. Genes for a characteristic found on homologous chromosomes may or may not be identical. So the ones I just circled here, they've coded them with slightly different colors, so they have a different allele, not the, not the same allele for the same gene. Alternative versions or forms of genes found in the same uh, gene locus are called alleles, and these only arise from mutation. So when DNA replication occurs, mistakes in DNA replication can lead to the uh, production of new alleles. So, speaking of alleles, each somatic cell carries two alleles per characteristics, one per characteristic one on each of the two homologous chromosomes. And that is because, remember, somatic cells are diploid, so they have two copies of every chromosome and also two copies of every gene. Uh, if both homologous chromosomes, they carry the same allele at a given gene locus, we say that that organism is homozygous at that locus, so they have two copies of the same allele. We can look down here at the bottom left. Uh, this chromosome, this homologous pair, excuse me, the, both of the chromosomes have a big B 
for that gene. And this is just an abbreviation for what type of allele it is. Big B on that chromosome, big B on this one. So they are homozygous, it's the same. The next one, if two homo homologous chromosomes carry different alleles at a given locus, we say that the organism is heterozygous at that locus or, it, or that it is a hybrid. So the next two examples offer two different ways that a cell could be heterozygous. On the left here, big B, little b. One chromosome has a big B, the other chrom chromosome has a little b. Um, so what we write is big B, little b, just to abbreviate it in a convenient way. Why is it possible that it can be two ways? Well, that's because the chromosome on the left could have the one that's the little b, and the chromosome on the right could have the one that's the big b instead. And you might wonder, well, is that just flipping them around? Not exactly, and this will make a little more sense later. Suffice to say that remember that each chromosome is either from the maternal line or the paternal line. So I'll draw that in here, maternal, paternal. So there's two different ways to, uh, that could result in an individual being heterozygous. The mom could give the big B and the dad could give the little B, or the opposite. The mom could give the little B and the dad could give the big B. Lastly, we could also be homozygous for the other allele, and that's shown here, little b, little b. Also, heterozygotes are also sometimes called hybrids. Gregor Mendel is seen as the father of genetics, and he was a monk in a monastery, which is now located in modern-day Czech Republic. He did his research in the late 1800s, basically the same time Darwin was doing a lot of his most groundbreaking work. They did not, they, they never communicated with one another, which is a shame because were they to have done so, they, they would have been able to put a lot more of the theory of evolution together because DNA, uh, or excuse me, not DNA, but inheritance was not very well understood by Charles Darwin. He simply, Darwin just knew that traits seemed to be passed from parent to offspring and he didn't really know how, but uh, Gregor Mendel made a lot of progress. So who was Gregor Mendel? Number one, the, the title of this chapter, chapter, Patterns of Inheritance, kind of uh, makes sense. The Gregor Mendel studied botany and mathematics. So he is very well trained to be able to observe patterns in a numerical way. He experimented with pea plant inheritance in his monastery garden, and Mendel's background allowed him to see patterns in the way plant characteristics were inherited. Why were pea plants a good subject? Well, there's a lot of reasons. We'll talk about a few of them. And it is still not really known if Gregor Mendel was sort of lucky that he chose peas or if he chose them because they're so easy to study. So, number one, <clears throat> pea flowers have male structures that produce pollen, male gametes, by meiosis. And they also have female structures that produce eggs, uh, so female gametes, by meiosis. Also, those things are, both male and female parts, are located inside of this little chamber here. So what that means is each flower is protected from getting pollinated by another plant. So their kind of uh, MO is they self-fertilize, and that makes studying them simpler because you know that this plant reproduced with itself. And there's no unknown in terms of, well, what pollen happened to float in here. Two, pea flower petals enclose both male and female flower parts and prevent entry of pollen from another pea plant. Pea plants can self-fertilize. Three, pea plants that are homozygous for a particular characteristic always produce the same physical form. So, for example, the, both of these are purple, and if this is a purebred or a homozygous purple plant, then it will only produce purple offspring. So that made it really easy to study what would happen, say, if he bred a purple plant with a white plant. And if they're both pure breeding, he knows that any differences in the offspring are going to be a result of the hybridization of the two different plants. Four, if a plant is homozygous for purple flowers, it will always produce offspring with purple flowers, and it's called true, blade, true, true breeding. Sorry, I already said that, didn't I? Lastly, Mendel was able to artificially cross two different true breeding plants with each other by introducing sperm or pollen from one plant to the other. So he would open up this uh, enclosed sac here where the male and female pet parts are, and he would insert uh, pollen from another plant in there so that he could be sure that 
pollen from a different plant of his choosing was going to fertilize this plant. Here is a list of all the traits that Mendel studied, and he studied them one at a time over multiple generations, and he was lucky that each trait had only two alleles. So the traits he looked at, or genes he looked at, were something to do with seeds, some stuff to do with flowers, pods, stem, and for each of these genes, there were just two alleles. So I'll abbreviate them, allele one and then allele two, and that made it a really simple inheritance pattern to study. Also, they all fell under the inheritance pattern uh, known as dominant and recessive inheritance patterns. There's some others, and if you don't know what dominant and recessive means yet, we'll get there. But suffice to say, there's many different ways that traits are inherited, and he got really lucky that every one that he studied is inherited in the same exact way with only two alleles. Some genes have hundreds of alleles. So, the language of a genetic cross. This is what he essentially did with every trait that he studied. The parents used in a cross are part of the parental generation, so we call that the P generation. The offspring of the parent generation are members of the first filial generation, or F sub 1. So, parents, they have offspring. The offspring are called the F1 generation. The offspring of the F1 generation are members of the F2 generation, etc. So anyway, he basically chose two different traits of true breeding. So right here, true breeding purple with true breeding white, and he bred them. And from the parent generation, when white was bred with purple, the result was all of the offspring, all of the offspring were purple flowered uh, plants. And that's what we mean by dominant. So purple is dominant to white. Mendel crossed a true breeding purple flower plant with a true breeding white one, as I just said. The F1 generation was all purple flowered plants. And what happened to the white flower trait? Well, that was kind of a mystery. So what he did was then he looked at the first generation of offspring. And remember, these plants can self-pollinate. So this one individual flower here, he had hundreds of them. But if we just consider one, it can reproduce all by itself. So he was interested in... Well, what if I just have this plant reproduce by itself? Is there still that white uh, flower genetic material in there somewhere? So what he did was he did that. Mendel allowed the F1 generation to self-fertilize. That is, he mated them to themselves. The F2 were composed of three quarters purple flower plants and one quarter white flower plants, uh, as shown here. So F1 generation, self-fertilized, and we get a quarter white, three quarters purple, and if you're wondering, well, was it always exactly three quarters? No, he repeated this over and over and over again. And that's another way that peas are great because peas have hundreds, hundreds, well, a lot of offspring, suffice to say. So if, for example, there were a hundred offspring, then his numbers would have looked something like this. Maybe <clears throat> sometimes he would get uh, 20 that are white, which is close to a quarter, not exactly a quarter, and then maybe 80 that were purple, so not quite a quarter. This is actually more like a four to one ratio instead of a three to one. Uh, but then he repeated it so many times that he just noticed that it was always about 75 to 25 if there was 100 offspring, 100 offspring. It was always about that, and he repeated this with multiple traits and, he, and the same experiment, right? So parent generation of true breeding plants produces the F1, then he self-crossed the F1, and he always got this same ratio, about three quarters that, what he called dominant trait, and one quarter what he called this recessive trait. So the results Mendel saw are due to the fact that for flower color and other traits in peas, there are two alleles for a given gene characteristic. Two, purple is the dominant allele, white is the recessive allele. Every cell in a pea plant carries two alleles per characteristic, um, either the same or different. So dominant and recessive alleles in more detail now. The particular combination of the two alleles carried by an individual is called the genotype. So down here, these are all genotypes. Big P, big P, big P, little P, and little P, little P. Those are all genotypes. The physical expression of the genotype is known as phenotype. So purple is one of the phenotypes, and white is the other phenotype. 
We can express these terms for purple flowers as follows. Assign a letter for the trait you are studying. For example, we can choose a capital P for flower color or just any P for flower color. Genotype possibilities are, as I already said, big P, big P, big P, little P, little P, little P. Generally, we choose whatever the dominant trait is to be the capital letter. So um, we would say big P equals purple, purple. And then little P equals white. We'd, we'd have to write out a code for our alleles. Write out a code for the alleles, and then everyone's really clear. Big P equals purple, little P equals white, and then when they go in combination, we get the actual phenotype possibilities. So only when there are two of the white alleles, little p, little p, is the flower color going to be white. If there's one of each, big P, little p, in this case, then it's going to be purple, and that's because purple is dominant to the white allele. Homozygous parents. So a purple parent, if they are homozygous, they can produce sperm cells and egg cells, and each of them will only have that dominant allele, capital P and capital P. We cross that with a white parent. The white parent also, same deal, they've got two little p's, so all of their sex cells produced by meiosis are going to uh, contain a little p if it's a sperm cell, or also a little p if it is an egg cell. When we combine them in the F1 generation, so from those true breeding homozygous plants in the parent generation, the F1 generation from homozygous parents will look like this. One, uh, we could get a capital P from the sperm that will fertilize the lowercase p in the eggs, in which case we get this genotype, heterozygous. Because there's one big P, the phenotype is purple because purple is dominant to white. The other option is this. The white plant could donate a sperm or pollen cell, and the purple plant could have the egg cell with a capital P. It's the same situation, just in reverse, a different order of heterozygote, so the, uh, of heterozygosity. In this case, the white plant gave a, um, a sperm cell, and the purple plant gave an egg cell. But the same genotype is the result, still purple. In the F, the F2 offspring from F1 parents, let's remind ourselves the genotype of the F1 parents is big P, little p, and this is a self-cross. So we could write it out, big P, little p crossed with, well, itself, or oneself, big P, little p. So self-cross is going to be the same genotype crossed with the same genotype, and we're still going to sort of consider them as two different parents, because he had a, a lot of flowers, so... They were all mixing. So the possibilities are as follows. From each parent, because of um, uh, segregation of alleles in, in meiosis, homologous chromosomes separate, each sex cell is either going to get a big P or little p from each parent. So big P or little p. And then the same thing here, they segregate. So either a big P or a little p. Shown over here, and we're still kind of uh, shown over here, we could get a big P and a big P from the male and female parts, in which case the genotype will be big P, big P. The other option is we could get a big P from the male part and a little P from the female part, in which case heterozygote and still purple because purple is dominant. Other option is we could get a little P from the male part and a big P from the female part, in which case still purple. Last option is this. Uh, one quarter of the time, both the, both the sperm cell and the egg cells will have a little p. So little p plus little p is two little p's, two little p's that code for a white, so we get a white p. I understand that's a little confusing, talking about the letter p in p plants. So about 25%, or only a quarter of the time, will there be a white phenotype. And we'll explain this in, in more detail now. So genetic bookkeeping, a technique called the Punnett square helps us predict what genotype the offspring will have based on what alleles the parents have and could possibly pass to their gametes, which then randomly combine to produce the offspring. So that F1 self-cross, so I'll write it out again, big P, little p, crossed with big P, little p. Let's consider the first 
parent here. Half of their sex cells are going to get a big P. There it is, half. And we could also write this as 0.5. The other half little uh, of, uh, of this parent's gametes are going to get a little P. And we could also represent, represent that as 0.5. So that's one parent. These are the gametes that can be produced from one parent. The other parent, same genotype, so it's the same story. Half of their gametes will be big P, or we could say 0.5. Half of them will be a little p. We could also say 0.5. Now, the reason I just add this 0.5 in there is some of you might be mathematically inclined, so this might help you understand this. So I'll come back to those numbers in a second. For now, what I'm going to do is just bring down the letters. So let's look at the top left. Um, I'll circle it again. This one right here. Let's bring that down through the column. So big P, big P. Uh, now let's do the same thing for this one. Little P. So little P and little P. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go over here. And so that's from the other parent. Big P, we're going to bring it right, right across that row. So big P and big P. Same thing for the last one. We're going to bring it across, and that is a little P. And I'm going to draw it here. And by convention, we always draw the recessive allele second. So big P, little P. And then um, another little P here. It doesn't matter what order because they're both little P's, right? So we can now see that about a quarter of the time, um, both parents give a little p, or their, rather we could say both parents produce a gamete that leads to fertilization that has a little p. So 25% of the time, we'll have little p, little p. Let's go back to those numbers, 0.5 and 0.5. So 0.5, or half the time, one parent gives a little p, and then 0.5 of the time, so half the time, the other parent also gives a little p. So 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25, or rather 25%, or a quarter. So this square right here is uh, represents a quarter of what happens when these plants re reproduce. So 25% of the time, this is going to happen. Same thing, let's look at the, um, the homozygous big P in the top left square, 0.5 percent, or 5 percent of the time, that's not what we say actually, um, half the time, or 0.5, one parent gives a big P, and 0.5, the other parent also gives a big P. So 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25, or a quarter, or 25 percent. Now, the chances of producing a heterozygote, so one big P and one little P, that's where this gets a little bit more complicated, and I'm going to erase some of what, uh, what I've got here because it's just getting so messy. Wait a minute. No, I'm not. Then it'll be even more weird. So let's take a look at this bit right here. So half the time, one parent gives a big P, and at that same time, the other parent will give a little P. So 0.5 times 0.5 is, once again, 0.25, or 25%. But now there's another way that we could get a heterozygote. So top right square here, right here. Uh, the other way is just that the other parent. So this parent instead gives a big P and this parent instead gives a little P. So that, that's the second way we can get a heterozygote. So again, 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 or 25%. 25% plus 25% is 50%. So, last thing here is we expect, I'm going to erase everything now, uh, we expect the, the, the genotypes in this cross to be 25% um, homozygous dominant, so a quarter of them will be big P, big P. We expect a quarter of them to be little P, little P, and then we expect 50% because it's 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 to be heterozygous. Steps in working through genetic problems. And by the way, the math part of that, I'm not going to ask you to reproduce that math, you, but you will need to know, uh, be able to predict what's the probability of a given genotype if I give you a cross. But we're going to do some more practice, so don't worry. Steps in working through these problems. Number one, assign a letter for the trait you are following. 
and just one letter per trade for for this course. So any problem I assign you, just one letter, that's fine. So for example, C for hair color, I for eye color, H for hair texture, something like that. Make a genotype and phenotype key. So write out big H, big H, and big H, little h, all equals straight hair, little h, little h equals curly hair. Identify the genotypes of the parents, big H, little h, crossed with little h, little h, for example. So the kind of problem I might give you um, in this context, I might tell you all of the information I've just told you, and then say, so this is the cross, a heterozygous, heterozygous straight-haired person, so straight-haired, heterozygous, uh, has a child with a curly-haired individual. And then I might ask you, what is the probability that they will have an offspring who has curly hair? And it'd be 25%. Set up your Punnett square, fill in the boxes, analyze. Here's a practice problem. So why don't you pause the video and see if you can work through this. So pause it now. If you didn't pause it, all right, now I'm going to work through it for you. So a woman who has heterozygous, who is heterozygous for straight hair, mates with a man who has curly hair. So big H, uh, little h, is heterozygous for straight hair. So that means straight, straight hair, uh, mates with a man who has curly hair. So little h, little h, curly. So what are the parents' genotypes? I've just written that out for you. Big H, little h, and little h, little h. What are the genotypes of their potential offspring? And then what are the phenotypes of their potential offspring? So how we do this now is as follows. Let's consider the woman. Big H, little h, she is heterozygous with straight hair. So half the time, she will produce a gamete that has a big H. Half the time, she will produce a gamete that has a little h. So what is shown there is the potential gametes, the potential gametes from one parent. Let's consider the other parent. The other parent is a man who has curly hair, so curly hair, so he can only produce one gamete. One time, 50% of the time, he'll produce a little h. 50% of the time, he'll produce another little h. Now, we uh, the, these empty squares here represent potential offspring. So potential. Potential offspring. I know you can't read that, but you can hear my voice. Potential offspring. Offspring. Potential offspring. So it's uh, big H from mom and then little h from dad. And then little h from dad and also little h from mom. This one is a big H from mom, little h from dad. And lastly, little h from both mom and dad. So that is it. What we can say is as follows. Looks like, I'm gonna change color here. So half of the time, we are going to produce, they're gonna have a child who has curly hair. Half of the time, they will produce a child who has straight hair. Because uh, straight hair, the straight haired allele is dominant to the curly haired allele. Okay. Practical application and the test cross. So suppose you have an organism that shows the dominant phenotype, like purple flowers. Is there dominant? Or is there genotype big P, big P, or big P, little P? Each of these genotypes um, would produce a purple flower. So if you really want to know, um, you well, you can't say. So you will have to do what's called a test cross. You cross the unknown dominant phenotype organism. In this case, the purple one. I'm going to circle that now. That's the purple one. We don't know. Is it big P, big P, or big P, little P? And you cross it with a homozygous recessive organism. So why homozygous recessive? Well, firstly, if we know that purple is dominant to white, as soon as you see a white plant, you know what its genotype is. So there's, there's no unknowns for this trait. It's little P, little P for sure. So we cross them. And if all of the offspring are as follows, so if all the offspring are purple, like here, like shown here, then it must be that the parent or the unknown is big P, big P, homozygous dominant. If, on the other hand, we get at least one white flower, then we can say that the purple unknown flower must be heterozygous. So here's, if you want to do this in Punnett square form, we can do it like this. If the unknown is big P, big P, 
Well, let's draw that right here. So big P, big P. In this case, we're crossing up so with a white flower, so little P, little P. And you can see here that all of them are going to be heterozygous. Big P, little P, big P, little P, big P, little P, and big P, little P. So they're all heterozygous, and they are all purple because the pur purple allele is dominant to the white allele. The unknown is big P, little P. In this case, so uh, half of the gametes will be big P, half the gametes will be little P. And then the test cross is always little p, always little p. And so we cross them as follows. Big p, little p, and then little p, little p. And then from the unknown, if they're heterozygous, big p, little p, and then little p, little p. So if the unknown is, in fact, heterozygous, we expect about half of the offspring to be white and the other half to be purple. But even one white pea plant would confirm that the purple flowered parent is heterozygous. Traits are inherited independently. Mendel also observed that the traits that he observed were in, inherited independently. That means the flower color trait has no impact, impact on how the seed color trait was inherited. Same with all seven traits he studied, if, uh, it, whether it's color, flower type, uh, the surface, whether it's wrinkled or smooth, they have no bearing on one another. He figured this by observing how two traits were inherited. And this is called a two-trait cross. So let's follow an example for following the traits of seed color and seed shape. So we expect that whatever seed color a plant has is going to have no connection to the shape of its seeds. The allele symbols we assign are going to be big Y for yellow, little y for green, so green's recessive, normally lowercase for recessive. <coughs> S is for smooth, dominant. Little s is for wrinkled, recessive. He started by crossing two true breeding parents with both traits. So this means they were homozygous for each trait, the parents that is. What would the parental genotypes uh, and phenotypes be? Here we go, P generation. So big S, big S, that's one gene, two alleles. And big Y, big Y, that is one gene, the two alleles. So now we're showing uh, with this abbreviation here, big S, big S, big Y, big Y, we are showing that we want to represent two genes, each of which has two alleles and they are homozygous. So crossed with the other true, be, true breeding recessive individual, little s, little s, little y, little y. Next, each parent has the same allele for their gametes. So 100% of this cross produces an F1 generation with what kind of genotype and phenotype? You can pause it if you want. They're going to be heterozygous. And how we would write that down is as follows. The F1 generation is going to be big s, little s, big Y, little Y. So yellow smooth seeds because big S is dominant to little s, so uh, smooth, and big Y is dominant to little y, so yellow. He then self-crossed the F1 generation. This is where we can set up the Punnett square, but instead of four squares, it's going to be 16 squares to account for all of the possible combinations of these two traits. Get ready. So let's consider one of the parents. Remember, uh, the top of the Punnett square here, this represents the potential gametes that can pre be produced by this parent. Now, since it's a self-cross, um, it's the same thing down here. These are also the potential gametes that can be produced by this same parent. So they're going to be identical. If you look at them, they are identical. This is identical to that. This is identical to that. All right. Uh, next. Next, what are we going to talk about next? Next, we're going to talk about this. Let's talk about one of the, the genes only. So big S, little s. Um, the gametes, half of them are going to have a big S. So notice, this one has a big S and this one has a big S. The other half will have a little s. Notice, this one has a little s and this one has a little s. So why do we draw it or write it two times? The reason, reason the weaven, the weaven that we have to write it two times, sorry about that, is that the other gene has two alleles and sometimes um, so let's look right here sometimes that big s is going that big s gamete will have a k 
capital Y in that same gamete, sometimes that big S gamete is going to get a little y uh, inherited in that gamete. And that is due to random distribution of homologs during metaphase one. Let's look at the next one. So the next one is uh, a little, little s. So half the time there's a little s, and half the time when there's a little s, there will be a big y. Half the time there will be a little y. Then we simply draw them down. So these possible gametes, as I said, they're identical as, as here. So same thing. I'm not going to explain this because it's the exact same explanation. We now combine them. So we bring those, rep, uh, those abbreviations for each allele down into this empty squares. Well, they're not empty, right? Because they're already filled, filled out. And we combine them. So let's just do a couple of them here. So big S, big Y plus big S, big Y is going to produce all big S's and all big Y's. So homozygous, homozygous. Let's look at the next one. This parent produces a gamete that has a big S and a little Y. So one of them, let me finish that, big S and little Y. And if it combines with a gamete that has a big S and a big Y, just add them up. There's two big S's, so yep, two big S's. There's one big Y and one little Y, so there it is, one big Y, little Y. Okay, so again, all dominant. And if you look at this, um, if you're really understanding this by now, then you can uh, already say that if we look, see this gamete, and this gamete is going to fertilize in all in this kind of combination, all of them are going to have both traits as dominant. Let's look at um, this possibility. If a gamete is produced that has both recessive alleles, in this case, we're going to get a lot more variation. So it depends on what gamete uh, this gamete fuses together with. Let's look at the second one down, this one. So the gamete from the other parent, or the cell cross, right, is big S, little y. So big S, little y means with little s, little y is this. Um, heterozygous for um, for seed shape and then homozygous for color. So it's going to be green because little y codes for green. All right, now, if you do not understand this, I would pause the video and read through this section um, for, uh, for this topic in your book. Last thing, the law of independent assortment is this. Traits are inherited independently of one another. And that's why we have to have this huge uh, Punnett square, S and Y are independent of one another. When you inherit a big S, you could inherit a big Y or a little Y. They are, they're not connected. It's not like all the dominant alleles are on one team and all the recessive alleles are on another team. Mendel predicted the events of meiosis. He didn't know anything about meiosis, but he basically did pre uh, predict them. So we know that the traits that Mendel observed are the genes located on chromosomes. Two, we now know the events of independent assortment that occur in metaphase one explain what he observed. In meiosis one, this is called random distribution. So that cross we just looked at, the self-cross of the F1 generation, where we had that genotype, uh, big S, little s, big Y, little y, that is shown right here, and now we've just drawn chromosomes inside of a little cell. So big S, little s, um, little y, big y. Random distribution when metaphase 1 occurs, one option is shown here. So one uh, pair of chromosomes are on top, big S, big S, big y, big y. And in this case, both dominant alleles are going to segregate into one gamete. So that gamete's going to get uh, the dominant alleles. The other gamete here is going to get the recessive alleles. The other possibility is this. So let's look on the right here. This random distribution, in this case, uh, the big S was on top with a little y, and the little s was on top with a big y. So in this case, we get different gametes formed. You can trace this out in the rest of the diagram here. Uh, long story short, here are the gametes that can be produced when random distribution causes the dominant and recessive alleles to be kind of mixed up. Uh, here's another one when the dominant and recessive alleles are mixed up. And then same story over here. When all the dominant alleles happen to be on one side of the equator, we get gametes that have all dominant alleles. 
Then we also get other gametes that have all recessive alleles when um, the chromosomes that have those recessive alleles all orient on one side on the same side of the equator of the cell during metaphase one. So what did scientists and us learn from Mendel's rules? Number one, all genes are governed by alleles found at a single locus on a pair of homologous chromosomes. There are two alleles, or versions of a gene, for each characteristic or gene type, and one allele is dominant over the other, uh, which is recess recessive. But this is not always the case, and in fact, it is mostly not the case, which is again why it is uh, wondered whether or not Mendel just got very lucky in his choice of studying peas and in his choice of studying these very simple um, traits. But the thing is, is most traits are much more complicated. So here are a few examples. Incomplete dominance is one, and we'll look at the example of color in palominos. Sometimes one allele does not mask the presence of another, but there's more of like a blending. So when the heterozygous phenotype is intermediate between the two homozygous phenotypes, the pattern of inheritance is called incomplete dominance. So if we look at a cross between two heterozygous, let's look at the one on the bottom, male palomino, C1, C2, what is, well, we're just going to say C stands for color. Um, <clears throat> we'll say C1 looks like they've got C1 standing for kind of dark, so kind of a darker color allele. And then C2 is another allele that stands for basically lighter color, lighter color in the fur, uh, in the hair. So each one is heterozygous, C1, C2 for the male, and then again, C1, C2 in the female. We are still looking at a pretty simple trait in that there, it's just one gene and two versions of the gene, so two alleles, C1, C2. So half the time each horse produces C1, and there's C1, and there's C1. Half the time each horse, is, horse produces C2, and then down here, C2. Then we fill it in. So some horses receive both C1s, and their fur color is chestnut. Some receive one copy of each, C1, C2, and this one as well, C1, C2, and I guess that color is called Palomino. My apologies, I'm not exactly a horse expert, but I, I figured I'd stick with um, stick with the, the books example. Uh, and then last one is C2, C2, and there you go. They uh, have a lighter color. So intermediate phenotype is what is produced in heterozygotes in incomplete Multiple alleles. This is a really common one. Oftentimes, there are more than two possible alleles for a given characteristic, but each individual still carries just two alleles for this characteristic. <clears throat> Think of the coronavirus as an example. They keep talking about various strains of the coronavirus or that it, that it has mutated. And uh, okay, sure, those things are true. And each mutation produces yet another version of a given gene. Often they'll be talking about a spike protein, and so the more it mutates, the more alleles there are, the more variation in it there is. Um, back to a simpler example, a couple of, uh, of, of alleles in rabbits. Uh, big C, Big C, uh, Big C superscript CH, uh, Big C superscript H, and then little c, little c. We basically just have four alleles shown here, and I've shown you what the homozygous condition looks like in each of them. Then if you combine all of these various alleles with each other, they may interact in ways, well, they certainly will interact in ways that are a little bit more complicated than the dominant recessive inheritance pattern. Same thing is true for eye color. We often say, or think anyway, that brown eyes, for example, is dominant to blue. And to some extent, that is a little bit true, but it's not quite true because there are way more than just two alleles for eye color. That's why there's so many different eye colors. Codominance is another. So when we when you study codominance, when you read about it in the book, I recommend taking a look back at incomplete dominance and noting the difference differences between them. Codominance is not does not produce an intermediate phenotype. It's not like a middle. It is both alleles are expressed. So some alleles always expressed even in combination with other alleles. Heterozygotes display phenotypes of both the homozygote phenotype um, of both the homozygote phenotypes in codominance. So 
black and white, and this is maybe not the greatest example, which is why we'll go over another one. Um, you cross them, and then you get a heterozygous if they're both purebred, right? So B, W, B, W, all of the offspring are B, W, and they have some black feathers and some white feathers. We call them checkered. Note, it is not gray. It is not an intermediate between white and black, even though, yeah, it does kind of look like that. So heterozygous display both phenotypes coded for by each allele. Here's another example, the blood grouping system. What blood group, what blood type are you? Here, the gene is blood type. And there's a little blurb in your textbook about this. I figured I'd give you a little bit more details here. The gene is blood type. What type of blood? The alleles, there's three of them, A, B, and O. Possible genotypes that a person could be is, well, each person has two alleles, uh, two copies of each, each gene, right? So big A, big A, big B, big B, A, B, a, O, B, O, and O, O. And yes, if you wanted to switch this around and say B, A, then you could do that and it would mean the same thing, but by convention we just say blood type A, B. So an example cross, A, B crossed with B, O. So if you remember the rules of how you draw a Punnett square, it's pretty simple. I'll draw the A, B parent on top. Half the time uh, a gamete will receive an A. Half the time a gamete will receive a B. From the other parent, Half the time their gametes will receive a B, half the time an O. You combine them, A, B, 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 A, O, and B, O. So in this case, um, <clears throat> each square represents 25%, a 25% chance that an, a child born of this cross would be that blood type. Pleiotropy. Some alleles of a characteristic may create multiple phenotypic effects. That is pleiotropy. This is different from Mendel's rules, which specify only one phenotype is possible for any given allele. One example is the SRY gene in male humans, and the SRY gene stimulates development of gonads into testes, which in turn stimulate development of the prostate, seminal vesicle, penis scrotum, basically male characteristics. And that is because in, in this example of pleiotropy, this one gene, the SRY gene, turns out that it regulates other genes. So it'll turn on and off a whole bunch of other genes, which lead to the development of a whole bunch of different traits. Sudden death on the court is also an example of pleiotro pleiotropy. How is it? Well, you do need to read those case studies so that you know, but basically this one allele uh, for this trait, it, it codes for uh, greater height, long, bigger hands, bigger feet, and also weaker arteries. So uh, it's really, really a sad uh, case just because people who are taller may often be better at some sports and then they also inherit weaker arteries. So pleiotropy can be, um, can make things complicated. Another, another thing to think about when you think of pleiotropy, um, Genetic technology is beginning, we, we basically have the ability to take a gene from any species and put it in another species, and pleiotropy is a really good argument for why that we might want to go slow doing that, or maybe we might want to just not do it at all. To some extent, this does become a moral discussion as opposed to just a scientific one. But the science side of it is this, you put a gene from one species into another, and you may be right, it just codes for one trait that is desirable, maybe it means that now you don't get cancer anymore or something, so it's amazing, it's amazing. But pleiotropy means that it could also code for all these other traits in who knows what tissue types, and maybe some of them are really awful, who knows. Polygenic inheritance. Some characteristics show a range of continuous phenotypes instead of discrete defined phenotypes. Firstly, what do we mean by discrete? Discrete, uh, when, when we say that, for example, it would be like the purple flowers. It's either purple or it's white, and there is never an intermediate phenotype. It, it's purple or it's white. Skin color is a really good example of a polygenic trait, and we're still not exactly sure how it is uh, coded for, but it's many genes. And if you just take the, a simple example or model for thinking about it, with one gene coding for darker skin, or excuse me, one allele coding for darker skin, one allele coding for lighter skin, and then you say there's three of them, so three genes, two alleles for each, and then you cross them, two, so uh, two people 
each of them have these three genes and two alleles. Some of them will randomly, by random distribution, uh, inherit all the uh, lighter pigmentation alleles. And then some people, by uh, random distribution, which is in metaphase one, will inherit all of the darker colored alleles. And so that's polygenic inheritance. And a bunch of other examples would be human height, skin color, body build, grain color, and wheat. And um, often these traits are uh, affected by the environment as well. <clears throat> for example, skin color, we can get a tan. Uh, for example, height, if you eat more of certain types of foods or if you just eat more food uh, and you are not malnourished, you're more likely to grow a little taller. So whenever you see a wide range of traits in a population, height, skin color, it's usually due to polygenic inheritance. And this should be a pretty easy term to remember. Poly is many, genic is gene. Environmental influence. So uh, yes, the environment influences skin color, influences height. In some situations, it is more um, kind of dramatic than that. So the environment can modulate how genes are expressed. Example, Himalayan rabbit, and there are some other critters running around that are basically the same, same exact situation. Himalayan rabbits have the genotype for black fur all over their body. So every cell, at least every cell in their skin um, has this gene and is expressing it. Black pigment is only produced, though, in colder areas of the body, the nose, ears, and paws. And the reason for that is this. The enzyme that produces dark pigment um, is inactive at higher temperatures. So if you remember back to enzymes, uh, and then we had uh, temperature on the x-axis, and then rate of reaction on the y, rate of uh, reaction, then we know it's going to look something like this for pretty much every enzyme, something like that. And so higher temperatures, the enzyme will denature, so closer to the rabbit's organs, uh, its core body temperature, and those enzymes denature, they don't work, and they cannot produce the dark pigment. Genes on the same chromosome. This is a totally different topic and is kind of interesting, maybe. When genes on the same chromosome are located close to each other, they tend to be inherited together. Characteristics whose genes tend to assort together are said to be linked, so linked genes and linked traits. So here, Gene 1 and gene 2, if they are that close to each other on one chromosome, I'll well, just think about it. If you inherit this chromosome, you're getting gene 1 and you're getting gene 2. And also, we should say, whatever allele there is on this particular chromosome for gene 1, you're getting that allele. That allele will be linked to this allele that is in gene 2. So not only are the genes linked, the alleles are also linked. Not linked would be uh, gene 1 is on a separate chromosome here, and gene 2 is on a separate chromosome. So these will independently assort. So whether or not a gamete receives this large chromosome is independent of whether or not it receives this small chromosome. Independent means they have nothing to do with each other, right? For example, if I go to the supermarket tomorrow, that is independent of whether or not you go to the supermarket tomorrow, unless, of course, you're stalking me. So hopefully those things are independent. Not linked. Uh, gene 1 and gene 2 are still on the same chromosome, but remember that crossing over happens. So whatever alleles are for gene 1 here and whatever alleles are for gene 2 here, sometimes they will be separated because crossing over will happen and neighboring regions of chromosomes are exchanged. Cut, cut, and then switch, switch and then we will, we will have a recombined chromosome. So those alleles will become, when you say that, when, when the book says that these are not linked, yes, you can say that. You're not gonna be wrong, so just go ahead and believe that. But the thing is, we often say that they are linked because crossing over just doesn't always happen. So anyway, very strongly linked. This is just complete linkage when they are this close together because it's much less likely that a crossover event will happen in this very narrow region between gene 1 and gene 2. Sex-linked genes are on the X or the Y chromosome, but generally we talk about the ones that are on the X. Genes carry on one sex chromosome. They're called sex-linked. That's because the X and Y determine our biological um, sex. So the X chromosome is much larger than the Y and carries over a thousand genes the Y chromosome is smaller and carries only 78 genes. If you read somewhere else that it carries more, well, I've read somewhere else that it carries more too, but not that many, more, like 120 or something. 
Uh, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, so the X and Y have very few genes in common. So they're basically not homologous chromosomes, although they do line up at metaphase one when um, all the other homologous chromosomes line up in meiosis. Since females, though, have two X chromosomes, they can be homozygous or heterozygous for a trait, <clears throat> right? Because they've got two copies of that X chromosome. Uh, a male, for example, just has XY. So they only have one copy of the genes on the X chromosome because uh, the other one's a Y chromosome and, and it doesn't have those, uh, those genes. Looking back up here, a thousand genes on the X chromosome Males have just one copy of those thousand genes. Females have two copies of those thousand genes. So for every one of those genes, if there's some mutation in one of them that's kind of a negative thing and it's recessive, females are not likely to be affected by it because most of the time these, these alleles that are unhealthy are pretty rare. So if you're unlucky enough to get one of these unhealthy alleles that codes for some kind of disease, really unlikely you'll also get a second one. So females have a second X chromosome that'll probably have the normal healthy allele on it. Where was I? Males do not have a second X-linked gene, um, so as do females, which can mask a recessive gene if, it, if it's a dominant recessive situation. This can be a problem if a defective gene is present on the X chromosome, so the female is likely to have a second good copy on her other X chromosome, while a male does not have another X chromosome to make up for the bad copy. And again, when you say bad copy, uh, some students will often think, well, why couldn't a female have two? Yes, they could, but often these negative alleles, bad alleles, they exist as is something like one out of 40,000 alleles. So if you think of 20,000 people, then, um, and each of them has two copies of, the, of, of every allele, then there'll be one of these alleles there. So what are the chances a, a female will inherit two bad copies? Lastly, many genetic diseases, including certain types of colorblindness or hemophilia, are sex-linked. Excellent traits. More common in males due to only needing one recessive allele to express the trait. Colorblindness is a common X-linked trait. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if we look at this example, an unaffected carrier mother, and we are showing here that she has two X chromosomes, two X chromosomes, and one of them has an X-linked recessive allele. So I'm gonna say that um, X big C is can see color, and X little C is can't see color. So half the time, her gametes will get the can see color, and half the time they'll get the can't see color. The male is just XY, and we're gonna say he's got the dominant allele, all right, so he can see color. So the male is gonna be written like this, X can see color, and then Y, I don't have a copy of that gene on me because I'm not a homologous chromosome of the X chromosome. So half his gametes will have X can see color, half of them will be Y. Now. If a male produces a gamete that has the Y chromosome and that gamete goes to fertilize an egg, so we'll model fertilization here, fertilization, fertilization, all of those offspring are males. So, so they're all males. So the, the remainder of this trait for colorblindness is gonna be completely determined by the mother for the sons. So let's bring down um, the traits, the, or the alleles from the mom, X, can see color and X can't see color. So half the males in this cross will be colorblind. And then I'll just finish this up here. Half the females will be homozygous can see color and then half of them will be carriers for this colorblind allele. Pedigree analysis. Pedigree's, uh, pedigree analysis is often combined with molecular genetics technology to elucidate gene action and expression. So what are the codes? Uh, males are square, and I, uh, you can choose any mnemonic device you want to remember this, but I, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize that's, that males are square. I always just think males are square. Don't be a square. Okay, I don't know. Females, they are circles. And parents are shown, I'm gonna erase that scribbling. Parents are shown with a square horizontal line 
connecting to the circle. So that is a pairing or parents. Offspring, I like so. And let me now actually go, oh no, no, no let me finish this. So affected, affected is completely colored in and half colored in means that they are a known carrier. Question mark means don't know. So let's look at A, a pedigree for a dominant trait. So parents are right here. The dad is affected. And uh, the dad, uh, let's see, can I deduce his genotype? Well, just look at one of his daughters. So here's a daughter over here, and she is not affected. And if this is a dominant trait, then I know she's got to have two recessive alleles. I'll make up uh, an abbreviation. I'll just say little d, little d. Um, she must have two recessive traits because she's not affected. So the dad, I can, can, uh, I can deduce, he must be heterozygous. The mom is homozygous recessive because she's not showing the dominant trait. And right, so then this son of the parent generation um, reproduced with this female here and had a whole bunch more offspring, uh, affected, unaffected, affected male, right? Now I'm adding the gender or the biological sex, unaffected male, affected female. All right. A pedigree for a recessive trait is next. I'll erase that. So colored in half, what that means is that um, they are both heterozygous. And so this individual, I'll, write, I'll use a little h to represent heterozygous, so little h, little h. And then the parents are both, they would both be big h, little h. And I'm just making up these abbreviations. And let's see, um, all of these individuals, uh, because this is a dominant trait, uh, we are not going to know if they are homozygous or heterozygous. Recessive genetic disorders. Mutations in alleles may produce genetic disorders. New alleles produced by mutation usually code for non-functional protein. So the original gene codes for a functional protein. Most of the time, uh, or at least much of the time, when a change happens, it, 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 uh, it, the change basically breaks the protein. Kind of like if you... Take a baseball bat to a car, more than likely you're not going to accidentally fix something on it. You will more, more than likely break something on it. Alleles coding for non-functional proteins are usually recessive to those coding for functional ones. Uh, it says here they are recessive. It's more like they usually are recessive. Um, heterozygous individuals are carriers for recessive genetic traits. And that's because if they have one good copy, then that one good copy of the gene codes for a functional protein. The mutated one codes for a non-functional protein. So this non-functional trait, you know, whatever it is, if it's producing maybe pigmentation, that'll be covered by the dominant trait, which is going to still produce a functional protein that will code for uh, skin pigmentation. Uh, recessive genes are more likely to occur. In a homozygous combination expressing the defective phenotype, when related individuals have children, that's called inbreeding, generally doesn't happen in Homo sapiens, does happen in other animals. Black bears, for example, they cannot recognize their mother when they grow up, can't recognize their father when they grow up, and that's one of the reasons why they are genetically basically programmed, the males that is, to run off, to run far away and seek new territory. It's a way of reducing the likelihood of inbreeding. So this is why two carriers of recessive trait have a high probability of having children who are not just carriers, but who have two bad copies of the allele as well. So you ever wondered why inbreeding was bad? Now you know. If uh, most of us have uh, one or two recessive alleles that we are unaware of and were we to mate with someone closely related to us, it's more likely that we that the offspring will get uh, a recessive allele from us and also the partner. So inbreeding is bad. Sickle cell anemia. <laughs> Hemoglobin is an oxygen transporting protein found in red blood cells and, and a gene codes for it. A mutant hemoglobin gene causes hemoglobin molecules in blood cells to clump together and that's shown on the the right-hand picture, the kind of elongated red blood cells. Red blood cells take on a sickle or a crescent shape and easily break, especially when they get into kind of the tighter parts of the body, such as joints, the capillaries and the joints. They can uh, clog up those little spaces. Blood clots can form, leading to oxygen starva starvation of tissues and even paralysis and even death. Um, so 
here I've written out the actually real uh, abbreviation to the allele. So alleles here. So normal is HBA. HB stands for hemoglobin. A stands for, I'm not sure what, but this is, this just stands for normal, HBA. Sickle cell stands for HBS. So this is what a, an abbreviation would be more similar to in, in, in actual science as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one textbook. But um, anyway, you don't need to, you won't be shown any complicated abbreviations like this on an exam. So, uh, over here, this is the normal phenotype. This is what red blood cells are supposed to look like. So this person would be HBA, HBA, or HBA, HBS. And that's because the sickling trait is recessive to the healthy trait. So if you have one bad copy, then the red blood cells will not be deformed at all. And so again, if we have a, uh, a Punnett square here and we crossed two heterozygotes, so HB B A H B S crossed with H B A H B S. So we fill in the potential gametes for each parent. H B A H B S. That's for one parent, and then the other one, it's the same thing. H B A and H B S. And then when you fill in, fill all these in, notice this square is going to be an affected individual who has sickle cell anemia. They're going to get an HBS allele from both parents, HBS and HBS. Okay. And then the, these two will be carriers, and then this one will be HBA, HBA. A couple example crosses, just to cement this one in. Key to the alleles is up here. Remember, HBA is normal hemoglobin, HBS is sickle cell. Question here, phenotype, uh, mother is a carrier and dad is affected. What's going to happen? Well, dad is only going to give the HBS allele. Mom is going to half the time give HBA, half the time HBS. So there's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio, one-to-one -one ratio of carriers to people who have sickle cell anemia. Another example, carrier crossed with a carrier. I gave that one. Sorry, I forgot I gave this example. So HBA will be in half of one parent's gametes. HBS will be in the other half. Same thing for mom, and then you get um, the following ratio as shown here. I'll let you read through it um, at your own speed. But basically, there's a 25% chance this couple will have an, a, a child with sickle cell anemia. Dominant genetic disorders also exist. So this, this means a mutation occurred that caused a protein to basically not lose its function exactly, but yes, lose its function and gain another function. Function so it didn't lose its ability to do everything. It just kind of changed what it does So <clears throat> many serious genetic disorders like Huntington's disease are caused by dominant alleles That means you only need one copy To be affected a dominant disease can be transmitted to offspring if at least one parent suffers from the disease and lives long enough to reproduce I know that my dad has a dominant genetic disease called Dupuytren's and it results in a lot of this kind of fibrous protein called collagen getting deposited in your hands or slow, cause them slowly to curl into fists. Not quite fists, but sort of gnarled, like old gnarled hands that are closing together. And I've got a 50% 50, 50 chance of getting it because he's got one bad allele. Uh, dominant diseases, disease alleles also arise due to new mutations in the DNA of eggs or sperm of healthy parents. So that can sometimes happen by mutation, just as recessive alleles can also happen by mutation. So Huntington's disease, for example, if we had one person who is capital H, so that is the dominant trait, that means they have Huntington's disease, more than likely they are heterozygous because the allele is extremely rare. Most of the time, if someone is going to get Huntington's, Huntington's disease from a parent, it's going to be uh, heterozygous. One of their parents is affected, crossed with someone who's not affected. So the trait would be like so. Uh, half the gametes have the Huntington disease allele from one parent, this parent, and the other half just have the healthy allele. So what we get is half of the, half of the time and half of the offspring will have Huntington's disease.